these rocks down here broke away from right over here Can you imagine standing on these big rocks here when it broke away from this area here? I don't know how long ago that was, but uh, that's right, I wouldn't want to take. I like coming out here every once in a while. That's the uh, Matanuska River. It's starting to freeze up, as you can see over here. Um, that dark spot across the way, that's just a tree laid over with the, with the uh, root ball showing. Anyway, Fred Alaska, thanks for joining me. Uh, Let's see, I'm filming this on Halloween, but I don't know if you'll see it until tomorrow. Oh, we got a squirrel. Little, little red squirrel doing this business. Anyway, uh, thanks for joining me. Sorry, got a little distracted squirrel. But uh, what I wanted to share with you today uh, was emailed a little while back from... Uh, Louie and Franco down in South America. Um, <clears throat> what what intrigued me is uh, these guys came up to Alaska uh, three years ago in the spring to do a wolf and bear hunt combo. And if anyone's ever researched um, guided hunting trips of any kind in Alaska, it, you're you're looking at a very very heavy price tag, um, especially to be taken. Uh, where they went was just on the outskirts of Katmai Wildlife Refuge uh, down on the Alaska Peninsula. Uh, when they arrived, it was for bear and wolf. And when they got there, uh, it was a little, little early for the bear. The guy told them the bears aren't moving as much, so it'd be a perfect time to get those wolf tags filled. Had got them to the spot. Uh, him and Franco had did their their uh, background work they took survival classes uh bear recognition classes you know to learn recognize male female black brown whatever uh they did it all of it you know hiker safety course all anything you could think of they went and did a class for it because they're coming from south america uh they both live in sao paulo brazil and uh they work in finance so louis and franco they do all their classes they invest the money with a reputable very reputable guide uh he don't want me to mention the guide or the exact area it was just outside of katmai and uh down on the alaska peninsula um he he spoke very very good english it threw me off at first uh, i didn't realize he was calling from south america anyway i digress uh <coughs> so they were given the lay of the land when they were flying in um, the pilot that was dropping them off gave them the heads up, you know, over here uh, Where they ended up going was The pilot pointed out that up on this ledge the shelf that ran across this basically big butte that stood up before it got into the mountains uh, He said it's a very good place for the wolves that come out from a very long valley and a couple finger little short finger valleys that would they could sit up there and spot and stock or, or take their shots you know they, they would have all access to a bunch of little rivers and streams that kind of kind of flow through there and so they were stoked um they planned on being there just four days to kill some time get let the bears you know come out of their den start moving a little more so and it's still cold in the spring in alaska don't let anyone fucking lie to you uh not a joke they were prepared they had a, a two-man tent they had all their stuff um, they unloaded and they had to wait um, to make sure, uh, what was it? One of them was missing some kind of documentation he had left at camp and they wanted to make sure that they would have uh, the tag uh, if something had happened and he, you know, got a wolf. You can't just take a wolf and say, oh, my tags are over there. You, you have to have those physically on you and punch immediately after the kill that's what's required by state law so there there was a little hiccup in that and so they decided the the pilot's going to be back in four days anyway um louis had uh his tags to fill so franco was just kind of like okay you know we'll 
we'll get his wolves and if there's more we'll, we'll stay another day and i'll get my tags fill mine whatever they had it planned out the pilot leaves and they go up and they make this little base camp um he said uh they they kind of hacked out this cove into some willows because there was really not a lot of trees to pitch tents to or stake down you know he he wanted a little better cover because of the winds that blow over that way and i get it so they hacked out this about a 10 foot radius into these willows with their machetes and they set up their camp and they had their fire pit just outside of it and basically horseshoe into the willows their tent in the middle um and, and the willows surrounded the back side now he said they uh they did a little bit of scouting they basically set up camp that first afternoon did a little bit of scouting followed a couple game trails and <laughs> that time of year it stays lighter uh it, it's not full-on you know bright sunlight close to midnight or whatever but it, it's still on the the upward scale of more and more daylight by the day um i've showed a few to, few examples of that earlier this spring so they decide they're going to go up on that shelf and just kind of look around you know familiarize herself with their topographical and put eyes on what they're seeing on the map type of thing which you know hey they get up there and uh since franco didn't have his um tags he had left them at the outfitters uh base camp or whatever uh he was gonna spot and louis was going to shoot uh I believe he said he had a 375 H and H because he wanted to be able to reach out and touch a wolf at a distance and also have enough whoop to get his bear. Now they get up there and he said it was very hard climbing. Um, it was uh, I'm trying to remember the term he used. It, it, it was more advanced hiking than he had anticipated because of how they had to switch back and cut through all the willows it, it's a thick tangle in some places so anyway they make it up there onto that shelf and they find themselves a little spot and uh franco breaks out the spot and scope and they're looking down into this particular valley it's the longest one that runs uh, i believe it was uh north south and then off of that valley there's a couple little finger valleys as it comes and opens up into basically a big meadow where a larger river meets a smaller creek and so on so they had this upper vantage point and they were glassing this valley the small fingers and, and they had a really good vantage point so as they're looking uh they they he said they're sitting there a couple hours and they're just about to call it and go down and get something to eat because they wore themselves out hiking up to this little ledge the shelf that that ran across and he said uh franco got excited just as it was starting to get dark because he saw what he thought were two black bears and a big brown bear uh chasing after each other down in between where one of the bigger where the bigger river meets a smaller creek so this where this little spline comes out he said they they're running around on it so they're excited for the next morning Hey, we got our bear tag if the bear's still there and it's it's of a good size we'll take the bear you know screw the wolves we'll, we'll we'll stick around for the wolves or whatever but let's see if we can get that bear and so they go back down to camp reinvigorated a little excited it, they knew it was too dark to try to spot and stalk this thing okay they already knew so they get to camp they eat a dinner and they were excited so they they called it a night kind of early and he said he was having a hard time sleeping because he was excited and way off in the distance he he heard what he assumed was wolf howling uh he said he had uh studied the sounds of wolves you know via the internet you know and recordings and whatnot to familiarize himself with things he might hear now uh hairy man bigfoot sasquatch none of that none of that was even on their radar uh they're from south america uh, their their stuff is 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 different. Uh, the things that they worry about are, are a lot smaller. So anyway, he he was sitting there trying to think. Man, that doesn't quite sound like a wolf. It's too there's too much. It's it's making a lot of noise. For wolves are too small to make that kind of noise and hold that kind of bellowing, howling scream. 
and he heard it go on off and on throughout the the beginning of them trying to go to sleep and so at one point he heard uh a scream that sounded a lot closer and boom he was up in an instant uh he he even got out of the tent it wasn't still quite dark but it was twilight and everything around him was in just darkness so even though the the sky was a little light everything else on the ground level with the brush and everything was just dark it, it was really hard to see so he grabs his flashlight and he's kind of kind of scanning around and way off in the distance when he was passing with the flashlight uh, he got a glimmer of some eye shine so he went back to it saw just one eye and and it disappeared and thought nothing of it figured oh that must be one of the wolves or something because it was at such a distance he couldn't put nothing to it so he's looking around he doesn't see anything and so he decides to call it a night again and so he, he crawls back into bed hears another scream way off in the distance and ends up falling asleep uh, he's woken up just before daybreak by Franco shaking his leg telling him there's something outside that there, there's some I think that bear is outside so Franco slides the rifle out of its case he's listening very closely he he loads up the four rounds and he chambers one as silent as he can and he has Franco unzipping the tent so he can hold and wield the rifle properly and be ready to potentially shoot their bear right in camp and you know hey great great trip didn't have to hike and pack it out is right there at camp well he unzips it and he kind of leans out with the rifle and it's still dark he can't really see anything so franco being a good dude there to help his buddy he unzips the tent a little more and beams a flashlight out and is kind of panning it back and forth now he said they didn't see anything but some darkness move and and the darkness would would move along and stop move along and stop with no eye shine and then as he was crawling out and he started he kind of bumped Franco's arm that was trying to hold the light for him Louis said when he got out and stood up and the light showed again then he saw the eye shine big eye shine uh, about 40 yards away uh, right next to some small willow shrubs in the tundra and all of a sudden crack 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 it, it it trampled over the willows and was gone and it was still dark enough to where he couldn't fully make it out but he made out a dark figure like thing tearing out so assumed it was the bear got up tried to light it up and 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 see if they could see it nothing so now they're awake and they decide well let's stoke the fire let's make some breakfast let's get a higher vantage point and find this bear well they do their thing they get back up and they decide to go back up to the spot where they uh franco had seen the the what he thought were two black bears and one big brown bear so they get about halfway back back up to that shelf and franco they're taking a breath or whatever and franco decides he's gonna glass where he saw those things last so he breaks out the spot and scope and he's free handing it without the tripod and he's just kind of glassing back and forth and as he's doing so where he saw these things running around on this finger the night before he saw a black dot across the smaller creek from there and so he started watching that to see well maybe the the brown bear still chasing it around or something he, he you know he it was something to focus on so that's what he did he he focused on it so as he's watching it uh he he noticed his weird movement because grant you it's not fully light out yet uh it's starting to get there but it, everything's still silhouetted and a lot of shadowy and and so it wasn't full daylight now <clears throat> his impression from that distance was a really really big black bear really big so he was basically trying to size it up um they they weren't there for black bear but you know they were kind of looking at what they had available and so they were discussing you know hey maybe we should get down off of this you know high ground and then get out into the open and cross over uh via sandbars and get to the opposite side of this little valley and, and see what we can see from there so they decide that's what they were going to try to do now as they were getting ready to do that 
Franco had to put the spot and scope back in its case and, and you know, get their gear back together that uh, he unshoveled, you know, got, got the, blah, blah, the spotting scope out. He had to dig stuff out of the way, so he had to repack some stuff. <laughs> so as he's doing that, Louis looking through his scope in that area, trying to, trying to zoom in. He had a, a nine by 12 or something like that, or three by 12 uh, type scope. And he was fully maxed out on his zoom checking out that black dot and he noticed that this black dot looked like it was doing tumbles and would stand up on two legs run a little ways tumble jump up and run off in the trees come back out do it again it was kind of doing this thing over and over and he was transfixed on that because he had never seen or heard of that kind of behavior and he's new to Alaska first trip here he's like what the hell so he's transfixed on that Franco gets everything together, taps him on the show, said, let's go. And he, he points out, hey, Franco, look, there's it, something weird going on. So they decide definitely worth going to check out. They come back down by camp and they had to pass by where they had camp and decided to lighten the load a little bit and grab some lighter snacks and, and you know, go on a day hike. So as they're at camp doing that, uh, he double checked the fire to make sure it was all the way out even though was, there was no risk of burning anything he was just real conscientious first trip to Alaska he didn't want to get in trouble for anything so to speak because you know he's new to Alaska new to the states so as he's doing his thing and Franco was changing something or another uh, he was a little chilly so he was adding a layer or something like that as he was in the tent on the back side of these willows uh, Louis hears like something very big smashing just out of sight behind these willows and as it's going along it's it's like it's going back and forth and away so it's like it was whatever it was was pacing back and forth and as he was listening he, he thought something was odd about it um, he was on point he had his rifle loaded you know he, he was prepared in case a bear rushed out but um, Franco comes out of the tent and when when Franco comes out of the tent, he asks him, "Do you hear that? Do you hear that?" And he said, "Yeah, I hear. Uh, it sounds like that bear." And he goes, uh, "It sounds like two feet walking, not four. And so he was like, "Nah, I, I I I I couldn't tell that." So Franco told him, "No, I heard two feet, not four. And so they were like, "Well, gee, that's kind of weird." So they decide, you know, we'll holler out, "Hey, hey, we're right over here. Be aware, you know." And as they do that, the thrashing stops and it goes dead silent. So they decide, well, let's make our way around this because these willows weren't just, you know, knee high. They, they were, you know, 10, 12 foot tall. And so they start going around this game trail to intercept this. They didn't know what, but they wanted to either confirm it's a bear, run it off if it's not, whatever, you know, they basically checking it out. So as they make their way around, they noticed that uh, the, there was a different feeling in the air. Uh, he said it almost felt like when he was stalked by a jaguar one time down in the jungle. Uh, he said it was very similar to that. And, and so he immediately thought, oh, it is a bear because I'm feeling that predator, you know, sense of a predator nearby. Well, <laughs> as he's telling Franco, hey, I think it's a predator of some kind. Uh, Franco notices dark movement just in front of them about 35 feet away and they decide to scream out to scare because uh, Franco thought it, um, what he saw was all black so they thought black bear so they start la, 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 start yelling screaming he's not pointing the gun in that direction he's just kind of waving his arms trying to startle this thing this thing then it stands up and he said when it stood up um, they 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 kind of stumbled back startled because of how tall it was uh he said it was over seven foot tall uh kind of slender uh humanoid figure real not big broad bulky shoulders but kind of slender like a basketball player but what they saw was pitch black and so they were just uh basically in shock now when they stumbled back and felt he had dropped his gun and they were just awestruck by what's unfolding in front of them this thing made a grunt or two and then ran off kind of uh quartering away from them but up going uphill up towards the shelf that they had been spotting from the day before 
and they didn't know what to do. He jumped up, grabbed his rifle, they, you know, snapped out of it, ran back over to the tent, and were trying to regroup on what the hell was that shit. Um, cause they, they were not prepared for any of that. They were prepared for bear, wolf, caribou, moose. They, they were prepared for all that, but not this. So immediately, uh, Franco being a, a devout Catholic, he, he started praying his rosary or whatnot. And he went, he retreated into the tent to get his rifle out. And as he was reciting some prayers, uh, Louis said that he, he was keeping an eye in the direction this thing ran. And he was noticing a black spot up there on that hillside. Now, this is approximately 300 yards away at this point. But this black spot stood out from all the other dark shadows in the brush. So he's focusing on it. He pulled his scope up and was trying to get a fix on it. And he couldn't he couldn't make anything out he could see the black dot he had a clear image of it being black and a little bit of movement but he saw no no bear paws no face n none of that and so he didn't know what to do with that information you know he was just watching it now as he's watching it he would every once in a while take his eye off the scope and speak to franco who was uh getting the gun out of the case and finding his ammunition and he was telling him, hey, there is that dark spot up there. It's not standing though. It looks like it's crouched back down. And they're immediately red flags waving. They don't know what to do. Um, they don't know if they should confront it. They don't know if what exactly it was. Uh, they were trying to run down the list of possibilities. Was it another hunter in a ghillie suit scaring them, playing a prank? Uh, they didn't think the outfitter was way too professional to play stupid games like that with people with guns that that would just be a good way to get shot so as they're assessing what they're doing he would periodically look back through the scope and the second time he did that that black dot was gone and so he said it must be moving on they heard nothing so now franco's armed he's got his binoculars out uh, he left the spotting scope and they decide they want to go and find what's going on here and be done with it run it off do whatever they got to do they come back up to this game trail and they start to quarter up the same direction that this thing was and as they're doing so uh louis had to stop and relieve himself and as he was relieving himself he got done and he looks up towards the direction he last saw that dark spot there's three standing upright looking down at them from about 220 yards away uh, a big lighter brown one that was bigger than the other two smaller dark ones and when they saw that uh they basically just retreated back to camp and full-on prayers uh they, they were they were doing their prayers you know whatever uh prayer for whatever I, i'm not catholic so i'm not trying to mock that i'm just saying they were they were going through what they felt was the best means to deal with it at the time and he said the whole time that they were down on their knees praying, they had their rifles by them, but they didn't know what else to do because something came over them once they saw these three beings up on the hillside a couple hundred yards away. They didn't feel right within themselves. They didn't feel uh, spiritually right is what he said. He said spiritually he was immediately uh, exhausted. So they were, they were saying their prayers. They heard some screams. They heard a bunch of commotion. They tried to ignore it. And basically they stayed. They didn't see anything else or hear anything else the, the next few days until the pilot came back to retrieve them. And they basically stayed in the tent. One would sleep, one would stay awake. And they did that for, for three days. And, uh, he he said it ruined the rest of of the bear hunt as well because where they were taken for the bear hunt wasn't all that far away from where they just were and they couldn't get into it they they couldn't get into it uh where they went for the bear there was another hunter from out of state somewhere in idaho and they asked him hey have you seen anything weird like this out of state hunter was like well no i haven't sounds like a bigfoot and kind of laughed it off and so they kind of just took that information stored it away and left it alone and didn't really get into the hunt from there and ended up going home but uh he said that 
he would pay that money again for the same experience, but this time he'd be better prepared. And I was like, well, that, you know, fair enough. But these poor guys went through all that trouble just to be stunted and not, not complete their hunt. Uh, he said they didn't come in again close to him or anything else like that. Once they were praying and they heard the, the screams and the brush breaking, everything just kind of subsided with the prayers, and he was thankful for that. So, I mean... I, I wasn't there. You know, I would have been praying too. But, uh, yeah, man. Uh, again, I'm filming this on Halloween. I'd like to uh, give uh, Larry Beans Baxter a shout out on the Alaskwatch channel. Alaskwatch channel, forgive me. I'll, I'll post a link. Uh, he, I thought he had a bunch more subscribers than he did because he, uh, he does excursions and, and, and various other things, interviews with people in state, out of state really good content so if you guys would check it out um let's try to get his subscriber count up i, I thought he was a well above a thousand he's like at 300 and something and that just boggled me anyway uh i'll leave a link you guys check it out you feel you know deem it worthy or whatever please subscribe to him let's get him uh let's get his numbers beefed up a little bit there and uh again thank you for joining me um again i'm down here at the matanuska river and uh we'll uh We'll catch you guys on the next one.